phillystartupleaders.org presents the 2010 Founder Factory Conference, recorded November 17, 2010, at the World Cafe Live in Philadelphia. Brought to you by Morgan Lewis, providing comprehensive transactional, litigation, labor and employment, and intellectual property legal services to clients of all sizes, from global Fortune 100 companies to just conceived startups across all major industries on the web at morganlewis.com and by Chariot Solutions, an IT consulting firm specializing in application development and systems integration using Java and open source technologies on the web at chariotsolutions.com and by Cone Partners, an independent insurance brokerage that delivers integrated solutions to meet client needs in business, benefits, life, and personal insurance. Also by Monetate, the leading independent provider of testing, targeting, and personalization for websites. On the web at monetate.com. And by Leadnomics, an industry leader in lead generation and performance marketing. On the web at leadnomics.com. In this program, Fishbowl Number 1, Adaptability, featuring presentations by Equal App, Zipwire, and Healthy Humans. Good morning. Uh, this is the first fishbowl, and our theme is uh, adoptability. My name is Kingsley, and I'm from Connector. Connector.com is a place where companies can find influential bloggers uh, to help them promote their products and services online to a targeted audience. And I'm joined by Joanne, who is a mother of four boys, and hence it is not surprising that her business about one is an online family management system with a philanthropic uh, mission. Um, in fact, her site was officially launched only last month, and I'm pleased to say that she's offering everyone here at Founder Factory a free one-year user license. Please chat to her afterwards if you're interested. Uh, so what is adoptability? Bring a product to market that is unique is often seen as a positive, the first mover advantage, people would say. However, sometimes a new product is so different that there's resistance to change. Hence, these companies need to focus their efforts to ensure that their target market or their target market smooth, smoothly adopts their new technology, and hence the new term, adoptability. This is often more difficult than one would think, and many startups fail at this point, opening the door for competitors to move in and piggyback off your work. As a friend of mine once said, it's the early bird that gets the worm, but it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. However, today we have three companies that have faced this exact problem, and have successfully avoided this trap. So the first company is Zipwire. So Zipwire was named Philadelphia Best Startup of 2010. It's a mobile payment service that enables people to securely send and receive money using a simple text message. The secure platform caters to individual users as well as corporations. And in their session, they'll share how they had to adapt their marketing plans, reevaluate their product concepts, and be humble enough to admit when they are wrong to gain the trust of their, those all important early customers. The second company is Healthy Humans. Healthy Humans is a software as a service healthcare platform providing continuity of care between physicians, patients, hospitals, and insurers to improve health outcomes and reduce healthcare costs. We will hear how Healthy Humans worked on burn rate reduction, an important one for me, organizational restructuring, and even how they raised funding in this tough economy, another interesting topic for me right now as well. And finally, last but not least, EqualApp. EqualApp is an online college admissions counseling program that provides high school students and parents with animated lessons, interactive application tools, and community and support services to improve an applicant's chance of getting admitted to college. They will talk about their experiences around strategies for pricing and the perceptions that go with those different price points, activities to reach their target market, and a favorite discussion topic for people in this room, the freemium model. So before I hand over to, um, before I introduce our moderator, Gail, Amy wants me to mention that for the people at the back, there's extra seating upstairs. And um, don't forget to tweet hashtag um, factory 10, hashtag factory 10. 
So now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Gil Bader. Gil is an inspiration for many of us in this room. He is a successful entrepreneur turned venture capitalist. In short, Gil helped pioneer internet advertising by founding Real Media in 1995. After Real Media was acquired in 2001, he then pioneered the next wave of online advertising as CTO of um, Takoda. And following AOL's acquisition of Takoda, Gil founded Genacast Ventures in partnership with Com Comcast Interactive Capital. So now I would like to thank Gil for being our moderator and hand over to him to welcome our panelists. Great, thank you very much. Uh, again, it's very exciting to be here with all the movers and shakers in the entrepreneurial community in Philadelphia. When, when I was asked to be a, a moderator, I thought, wow, this is exciting. I could be the Jerry Springer of you know, the entrepreneur you know, founder factory here. Uh, and then they settled me down and said, no, there are going to be no um, uh, you know, DNA testing, no chairs throwing and such. But hopefully it will still be entertaining for you guys. Um, so I'd like to introduce our, our uh, panelists today. Um, ben Ashpole is the CEO of uh, Bashpole Incorporated. We'll, we'll also see him later at Alternate Funding, uh, alternate funding Fishbowl. Um, Fareed Naib, you know him as the founder and CEO of DDC. Uh, Maya Josbakvili of Urban Escapes. Uh, Neil Kleinman, senior fellow of the Corzo Center at the University of the Arts and PSL board member. So I'd like to call up our panelists and have them take a seat there. Um, and then I'd like to introduce the Fishbowl companies um, and their representatives. So the companies were introduced, I, I will introduce the representatives. So first is uh, Mark Zowell, is the co-founder and CEO of Equal App. He received a BA from Cornell University and an MBA from the University of North Carolina. Mark is the author of a top-selling college admis admissions guidebook, Untangling the Ivy League, and an accomplished journalist with bylines in the New York Times, Washington Post, and People Magazine. Uh, and next is Anthony Gold. He's the CEO of Healthy Humans. Prior to this, Anthony was the vice president and general manager of the open source business unit within Unisys. Anthony's also ran hardware engineering for Unisys and invented the world's first Intel mainframe. Uh, he's regularly invited to present keynote speeches around the world on the model of Web 2.0 and mass collaboration. Next, we have two representatives from Zipwire. Sharif Alexander is a native of Drexel Hill and a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. He founded Zipwire in 2009 after spending two years researching and developing a simpler way to mobilize money. Prior to Zipwire, Sharif spent 15 years in IT working with open source technologies. And last but not least, Sybil Lindsay is the EVP of sales and marketing at Zipwire, uh, a native of, of Berks County and graduate of Philadelphia University. Sybil created the strategy, vision, and marketing communications for Zipwire as a former buyer and designer for Urban Outfitter and Anthropology. Sybil has built her career on the mantra of stay ahead of the curve, which is perfect for today. So with that, what I'd like to do is open it up to our, um, our, our fishbowl representatives and start off with Mark and to, to tell us a little bit about uh, some of the uh, their the issues, trials, and tribulations with adoptability um, uh, um, at, at Equal App. Yep. Well, thanks everyone uh, for coming out this morning. We're excited to present our, our company, Equal App, and talk to you a little bit about the adoptability challenges that we've faced, as well as kind of the strategies that we've pursued in order to overcome them. <clears throat> Equal App is an online college admissions counseling program that's been developed by former Ivy League admissions officers that provide students and parents with animated lessons, interactive application tools, community features, as well as some support services like essay review and private consultation that improve applicants' chances of getting into college at a fraction of the cost of a college consultant. So if you have um, recently been 
if you've had a child that's recently gone through the process, if you have a family friend that has, you know that applying to college is more challenging and it's more confusing than it's ever been, as well as more competitive. Um, students don't receive the support that they need in high schools. The average guidance counselor to student ratio is about 500 to 1. Um, counselors only spend about a quarter percent of their time on college counseling related activities. Uh, if you look at the options in the market um, for these parents and students that are going through the process, these alternatives really sit on two extreme sides of a spectrum. You have uh, college guidebooks um, or free web resources that are standardized, and you have college consultants um, who hold you, your and your child's hand through the entire process. They cost about $4,000. Um, on average, but in places like Philly or Boston or New York, they can be two, three, four times that amount. Um, and it's become a really booming industry. Uh, my business partner and I set out last year to develop an online program that would provide the same amount of personalized uh, support and insider knowledge as a college consultant, um, deliver it online via our pl uh, t uh, platform, and make it available to a much wider audience. So in, in terms of uh, the, the product and, and our business, it, it was a real, we have a really differentiated program. Um, one of the, the first challenges that I'll kind of quickly address is this relation between price and quality, especially online. So our programs range in price between about $100 and $400. Um, and we are making the claim that our programs provide a comparable amount of support as a consultant that charges about 10 times that amount. So um, from, from our kind of marketing perspective, the, the challenge really has been how do we communicate to consumers that, uh, the, that we can provide the same amount of value um, and support as a college consultant, but at a tenth of the price. So that, that's kind of been our first adoptability uh, challenge. The second is um, we operate on a, a freemium model, and so a free registration um, provides students and, and our users with access to several lessons, um, as well as access to our community message boards, which are moderated by former college admissions officers. So we don't provide access to any of our interactive application tools that help students with you know, selecting the right schools, writing their essays, searching for scholarships. All that's behind our paywall. So the, the, the second kind of challenge that we've faced in terms of adoptability is how much do we give away um, in order to in, in encourage um, adoption? Um, how do we balance giving away too much and, and taking away from the value um, that we provide through our, our subscription-based uh, service? The, la the last kind of uh, adoptability challenge that we've faced is one that's really not unique to any startup, and that's some um, differentiation in the marketplace. Um, we, we provide um, a very different type of counseling uh, solution than anything else that's currently out there. Um, the, the, the real issue for us is that this is a very kind of crowded marketplace. Um, parents and students are kind of constantly bombarded with test prep providers, consultants, books, and uh, there's free web resources. So from, from our company's perspective, in terms of marketing, um, how do we kind of clearly communicate our value that we can provide consumers, break through all this kind of market noise, and in doing so, um, spur adoption as well as growth for our business? So that's kind of a, an overview of, our, of Equalapp and what we're doing. We sell our programs directly to consumers. We've also expanded our, our sales channels to focus on uh, bulk subscriptions to high schools, as well as to um, test prep providers and nonprofits. Um, kind of outlined some of the adoptability challenges as well as the strategies that we've implemented in order to address them, and would be uh, interested in hearing thoughts, comments, both from the panel as well as from the audience. Testing one, two, three. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, what I'd like to do now is to turn to some of the panelists here and see if they have any comments, recommendations, etc. cetera. Um, so first, I, I, I'd like to ask a, an obvious question, uh, and that is your web presence. So how much of you know, conveying that, um, that the level of quality um, are you able to reflect in the site? And you know, by, by getting some um, logos on there of, of trusted entities, um, also you know, case studies, 
um, you know, success stories, affiliations with large organizations to, to sort of have that, um, you know, the, the, the larger brands out there have some of that halo reflected on you. So uh, we've, we've looked at developing partnerships. We really want to kind of piggyback on um, what other companies are doing in the space. We're not the only company that's, that's trying to reach that uh, high school target customer and parent that's going through the college admissions process. So um, we have looked to, and we are, we are partnered with several test prep providers, um, and we think that that helps kind of build the credibility of, of the business. Um, uh, in terms of inter what we're doing internally, so our program is, uh, our counseling program, our online counseling program is one component to what we provide. So we have access to these lessons and tools and community features. And we also sell uh, additional support services like essay review and private consultation that are provided by former college admissions officers. And so these former college admissions officers have worked uh, in a consulting capacity with many students. And so um, what we've been able to do is build off of their experience in college admissions in terms of the schools that they've worked at, as well as the number of students that they've worked with and the success rate in terms of their overall placement in, in, uh, in college. Yeah, last night I, I had the chance to uh, go through your site, and maybe I'm biased because I do come from a university world. It struck me that the free material that you gave was really promotion for your, uh, your, your product, uh, and in many ways repeated a lot of the information mm -hmm. that is already uh, in, the, in the short uh, marketing piece at the beginning. And what I, when I wanted to really test is the real meat. Uh, my, the principle, I guess, is why did, if you're going to give a free bite of the apple, you should give the, you should give that bite that really makes you addicted. I mean, it's the old drug dealer approach. Uh, <laughs> and once you know that, then you're ready to go come back to buy more. And it seemed to me the interesting stuff wasn't free. And so I didn't see how good you say you are. We, we really had, we had two options when thinking about the freemium model. The first is you provide full-time but limited access to a certain portion of your program, which is the route that we've taken. So when you sign up for a free subscription, you have access to a, a couple of our lessons that walk students through the initial part of the admissions process. And then you also receive access to our community message boards, which are moderated by former college admissions officers. So that, that's the first option. The second option is that you provide limited access, meaning three days or five days of complete access to the program. So that's the other option that we looked at. Um, what we've done now is we actually combine the two. Um, and so if you come to us independently like you did last night, you'll have access to, you'll have that first option which is limited access to, or you'll have full access to a limited portion of our program. Um, if you contact us or we also work on, a, our marketing approach has been via lead generation from other test prep providers and others working in the space. So we do outreach to those leads that are coming in internally. Um, and we, we put students and parents on trial, full, full access to the program, and then convert them over to paying subscribers. Let me just follow up for a second. Um, one of the ways in which you promote the free access is you say in the, in the beginning at the top part of your, of your page, this is a good chance to test what, how good we are. Mm -hmm. Now, I think a lot of people, before they want to directly connect with you, want to really get a sense, are you worth the time and energy? Do I want to give you more information about who I am, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd recommend that maybe you give us a random limit of ac access to the most interesting rich stuff, mm -hmm. just one, one bite that really shows me that you are as good as you say you are, rather than use the free access moment to really feel like you're being sold to. And that's the concern I had with the three uh, lessons quote you gave me. They weren't lessons as much as sales pitches. And that's not what I expected when I was gonna get free access to a lesson. And, and I mean, when we look at the, I mean, ultimately this is all about conversion of the customer. So, I mean, when we look at the conversion of our customers via that first option, the, lim the unlimited to the, to the limited, the unlimited access to a limited portion of the program versus the second option, which is you know, the limited time to the full program, certainly um, what we're seeing is that the conversion is higher with that second option. And so um, in, in terms of making changes to kind of the strategy of the, uh, and implementing this freemium model, we're, we're definitely heading in that direction. 
I wondered if I might ask you uh, questions about, uh, it, it seems like you're still exploring the exact path that you're going to take in the company. So I was curious as to what you're doing now to gather your user feedback mm -hmm. and find where the, the market's really at. And also, if you've discovered anything surprising compared to maybe in the beginning when you were asking friends and family about the idea, and they might have uh, I, I, had good I ideas or led Yeah, you I would say that there, there's a, I mean, it, depending on what stage of, of your, your company you're at, I mean, there's a big difference. I mean, we did, I put this company through a business accelerator program at UNC Chapel Hill. We did market research. We spoke to hundreds of potential customers. Um, there's a big difference between talking to customers about their interest in, in your product or your service and, and actually being in the market and having someone take out their credit card and, and pay you for it. So um, that, that's definitely something that you know, we've learned is that you know, we spoke to a lot of potential customers. They told us you know, what they were looking for in, in a program um, or in a counseling solution. Um, we, you know, made, we made changes and we based a lot of the program off of that. We go back out into the market and, and then it's challenging to kind of get them to pay for it. So you're like, well, we did what you wanted. What, what is it now that we need to do? Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of, I would just put a, as a cautionary note for those of you that are at that point where you're going out and doing that market research. Um, in terms of collecting uh, data and, and feedback, um, one of the, uh, I was uh, quoted in an article uh, uh, last month in Inc. Magazine about one person, the advantages of a one person sales force, because it's my business partner and I now that are running this business. And I, I, I told um, the reporter that the, the advantage is that you can directly communicate with your customer base. There's no additional bureaucratic layer between what we're doing and what our customers are telling us. And so when we're calling high schools and, and trying to get them to partner with us, we're hearing directly from them, these are the issues or these are our levels of interest. And I think having that direct contact with your customer base is extremely valuable. And I mean, as we grow our business, um, it's something that I, I know that the two of us are going to want to maintain just because it's, it's such an important part of the business building process, having that direct contact with your customers and um, being able to solicit that feedback so you can refine both your program or your service um, as well as your, your strategy to, to, um, to build your business. Okay. Um, so at first glance, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I see your market is there's two segments, right? There's parents who are looking for this sort of thing and parents who don't really know they need it. And I get the value proposition for the parents who are looking for it, right? You're like, we provide the same stuff and we're cheaper. Like, that makes sense. How do you convince all these parents who don't know they need this product? And specifically, I think it's a generational thing, right? Like my parents during college didn't even, like have a prep book for whatever test it was, right? So how do you convince them that now they need a whole program for applying? Yeah, I mean, how, how do they, they know it like a week before, you know, their application deadlines and they're like, holy cow, like I need to do something. So the, our, our um, sales cycle is very, is seasonal. And one of the reason that, reasons that we're pushing out into more of kind of a B2B approach, partnering with high schools and test prep providers is that our contracts allow us to level out our, um, our revenue streams. Um, in, in terms of, I guess in terms of, there's a lot of general education about what consumers need in this market. And we, we did our mar when we did our market research, we, we heard back from parents that, you know, especially those that had just gone through the process, that one of the, the we asked them, what did you use in terms of resources? And um, nearly half of them didn't use anything. And so that's a, both a challenge and an opportunity. Then we asked them, um, if you didn't use anything, why didn't you use anything? And obviously, the, you know, the primary driver is cost. And so there is an opportunity because the majority of students and parents that are going through the process currently are, are using very few or, or, or no resources. The, the challenge, of course, is that that involves a lot of education about why our program um, and why our additional support services are something that they can trust as well as something that they can utilize to give themselves you know, a competitive edge in, in, the, in the process. Great, thank you very much, Mark. And now Anthony from Healthy Humans. Thank you. Um, I'd like to speak about adoptability for Healthy Humans from two perspectives. Um, the first is the customer one, the one that, that uh, I think we think of first and foremost. Our initial business model was direct to consumer. Uh, we built personalized wellness plans for people with chronic illness, illnesses like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and those sorts of things. 
And uh, the wellness plans that we built gave uh, individuals all the tools, all the resources, all the support and motivation to help them get uh, much better outcomes. And we used all the typical outreach channels you'd think of to reach that kind of market. Uh, traditional advertising, email lists, uh, pay-per-click campaigns, uh, search engine optimization, uh, partnering with uh, large uh, healthcare social media groups and all those sorts of things. And we ended up generating maybe a, a few thousand users coming uh, to the site and using our, our programs, but we weren't knocking it out of the park. We had a challenge with adoptability and we were trying to figure out why. And one of the things that I found is when you want to figure out why consumers behave a certain way that they are, the best thing to do is just to ask them. And so I spent a lot of time talking with users, uh, those users who had been with us a long time, uh, those users who came and left pretty quickly, and everyone in between, to really get a feel for what was working, what wasn't working. And what I found were some very, very interesting things. Uh, for instance, the folks who stayed the longest, uh, spent the most amount of money with us, and got the best outcomes, and when I say outcomes, what I mean by that is in the case of diabetes, for instance, much better management of blood sugar, uh, reduction in weight, or in the case of high cholesterol, uh, much better uh, lipid panel. Um, so the folks who were staying the longest, spending the most amount of money, uh, getting the best outcomes with us, they had one thing in common. They had all shared the programs that we built for them with their physician. And the physician gave it a thumbs up and said, that's a good thing that you're doing, keep, keep doing that. And conversely, the folks who spent the least amount of money with us, churned the quickest, weren't getting great outcomes, they also had uh, something in common in that either they were not, had not shared their program with their doctor, or they did share it with their doctor, and their doctor looked at them and said, who the hell are these healthy humans doctors? I'm your doctor. And so a big aha moment for us where we realized that the best way to get to these people when it comes to healthcare um, is to go through their number one trusted advisor when it comes to healthcare, their doctor. And so we took a step back and really rewrote our entire software platform and all the engines around that to build what we call a continuity care model or continuity care platform to really connect patients and physicians, particularly when the patients are not in the doctor's office. And with this new model, of course, the patients love it because now they're getting all this great information, all this great connectivity coming straight through their doctor. Their doctors love it because it makes them look great. All this great content is flowing through them to their patients and they don't have to do anything for that. Of course, what that did is it shifted the adoptability challenge from the patients now onto the physicians. And any of you who have worked with physicians probably know that it's pretty difficult to get them to change the way that they operate or to get them to open up their wallet and spend money on something. So we knew that a key element of this new platform had to be not only um, helping patients get much better outcomes, not only helping the physicians look good, not only helping the physicians be able to uh, enhance their, the, uh, the management of their office staff, but that we also had to cater to what the one thing that trumps all of that from a doctor's perspective, what they care most about today. Any guesses what that is? Money, that's right. So what physicians care most about today, and any of you who are in the medical profession know this, that physicians, primarily primary care physicians, have been so squeezed with uh, the reimbursement models, how much money they can make, the hours that they're spending, the amount of time they get to spend with a patient, um, that what they care most about today is things that can help them bring in more money. And so a key element of this new platform that we put together was a way that not only would we generate additional revenue streams for the physicians, but that that revenue would far exceed what they were paying for the platform. So now we created a great win-win all the way around where physicians love it because their patients are getting great outcomes, their office staff likes it, it makes the physicians look good, and oh, by the way, the physicians now have a revenue stream that far exceeds what they're paying for the platform. Great thing, the only challenge we have now is we have so much opportunity in our pipeline and not enough resources to be able to close that. So if any of you know any great superstar salespeople, particularly in the healthcare world, please uh, have them reach out to me. Now I said I wanted to speak about adoptability from two perspectives. The first was the customer. The second is what I call internal adoptability. And the challenge with that um, is that, so we shifted our business model pretty radically from a direct to consumer to a B2B type of model. And while our investors love that because it's a much better business model, and our board loves that because, same reason, it's a much better business model, our new customers love that because they're getting great services, some of our internal employees did not like it. Some of them were really attached to the old business model and wanted to continue pushing that model. And many of us who have been in the startup world for a while realize that 
you have to be nimble, you have to be able to react quickly to market changes. An old mentor of mine once said that uh, the key to startup success is not that you necessarily have a brilliant idea, an initial brilliant idea that you can get to pop, and we heard this from Fareed earlier, that the key to startup success is that you last long enough to figure out what works and what doesn't work, and you can find a way to, to make something happen in the marketplace. And so the challenge around internal adoptability, particularly when you have uh, employees that, that don't get it or aren't willing to change, that you either have to rapidly get them on board or you have to move them aside so the business can move ahead uh, more quickly. So that's a real brief introduction into healthy humans and some of the challenges we faced around adoptability. I appreciate your time and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, questions from the, 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 or comments from the panelists? Yep. Sure. Yep. Sure. Go ahead. I mean, it, um, it's funny you say that in terms of the adaptability of your own staff. Um, I certainly have seen that a, a lot of times in which, you know, these people are used to doing something one way, even though you create it that way, and when you decide to change it, they're like, are you crazy? And you're like, wait a minute, I'm the one who told you to do this. Why, why can't you change? Um, and that's a really difficult thing because if people don't believe in the new direction, then you end up uh, not, not going there. I found that... Um, even though it was perfectly clear in my mind, and I, I've got at least two ex-management members who are probably smiling at this point, but even though it was uh, not perfectly clear in my mind, you know, the more time I spent explaining why I was switching things, um, actually, I forgot I have my new company too, three members, um, the more time I spent explaining why I was switching things, the, um, the um, better it, it went. So, um, you know, lots of time. Basically. Yeah, it's a great point. We actually took the route of we just fired them all and moved on. <laughs> I'm kidding. We, we didn't do that. Um, that. That's an excellent point, and that's exactly right, that you can't communicate, you can't communicate enough um, the vision, the strategy, and, and where we're going, particularly, you know, with some of the newer employees who, you know, it's a big risk joining a startup. You're, you're not getting as much money as you could be at, at a large established company. Um, you're doing it because you have a mentality and a mindset that you want to change the world and you want to do great things. Um, but many people, many employees in a startup, you know, want to be led, and, and the best startups have really good leaders who can help create that vision and get people excited and fired up about it, and it's going to change. It's going to change, and when it does, that's a big test of leadership that how effective can you be at getting people to move from one position that they were so passionate about to not necessarily dismiss that, but to adopt one that's even better, has even stronger chance of realizing the vision, vision and achieving that that chance of changing the world, which is what you know, many people want to do around that. So it's a great point. Yes, sir. Your, your strategy, your new strategy, makes a great deal of sense. What struck me is the way in which it's not reflected in your website. The website still is a website that invites uh, patients, insurers, and others. And in fact, I was really struck by, the, in fact, on the website, the, the fact that what you say to the providers is a very passive thing. They quote you, you say, um, we encourage you to reach out. If you're interested in bringing Health uh, Hub to your practice, you're encouraged to reach out. It's not a very aggressive sales pitch, nor is there any of that uh, detail that says this is a good business proposition. And the only thing I'd recommend to you then is if in fact you're selling it to the physician as businessman, you probably want to have a very tough, realistic, uh, commodif commodifiable uh, information that makes it clear why it's a good business proposition, which means then it has to be a separate, you don't want your patient to be able to see it, nor the insurer to be able to see it. And at this point, it, the site is open to everyone. You want to focus and target on your primary audience, which you don't do at this point. Yeah, that's why they call this a fishbowl, I guess. <clears throat> Um, yeah, our, our website sucks. It, it's, I absolutely agree. It, it's terrible, and it needs, it needs a lot of work. And, you know, one of the challenges, and points very, very well taken, one of the challenges of a startup, particularly when you have a limited number of employees, is you have a limited number of people who have to do everything. We heard from Freed about taking the trash out, but everything is everything from the website. It's all the sales. It's all the business. It's all the marketing. It's all the engineering. It's all the development. It's all the customer support. It's all of that. And there are going to be trade-offs that are made on a daily basis as far as, you know, what are we going to work on today? What are we going to work on tomorrow? Not to mention fundraising and all the elements around that. But a great point is your website is your public presence. And so it's definitely a point well taken that, you know, that's an area that I'd like to see us do a much better job of getting that ramped up much more quickly. 
Um, so, so thank you for that, that feedback. Um, I, I really liked your point about internal adaptability because I know my company went through a couple of different transitions and it's probably going to do a couple more, I'm sure, before the product's quite right. Um, but what I found in my own experience was that there's a way to talk to my staff and, and the people around the company and a way not to do it. Um, software engineers, I, I think, in, in my case, are scared of change. <laughs> and so I found that um, if I wanted to have a brainstorming meeting, I had to either uh, do that just with somebody else, like an advisor, or I had to very, very clearly delineate, this is not planning, this is not everything falling apart, this is just thinking. It's okay, we can think. We came up with this stuff in the first place, we can change it if we want to. And um, I wondered uh, if you had any, any special techniques that you used in uh, you know, convincing them or talking to them um, for me, for example, I, I tried more of a Socratic method in uh, trying to get them to see the light without really pushing it on them. Yeah, those are, those are great questions and great points that Ben makes. And prior to joining Healthy Humans, um, I ran engineering for Unisys, so I had quite a bit of experience working with engineers and what's that like, what, what's, what that is like and, and making changes around that. And we actually started a, a new business inside of Unisys uh, around open source software. And so we took a few thousand engineers and essentially created a whole business around it that ended up being uh, quite successful. But the challenges we faced going through a startup inside of a large company were very unique. But there's no doubt that software enge engineers in general, um, they're very logical, um, they're very black and white thinking. Um, and I, I speak from, from the heart because I, I was one. Um, and, uh, and the best way to, um, to get them on board is to apply to their sense of, of logic and rationale on here's exactly why we're doing this, here's how it's going to work. Here's how what you're doing is going to be a part of it, but without necessarily dismissing the work that had been done before, because there's a certain element of if I created it, you know, it must be good, and to, if it's being thrown away, it must not be good. And so to realize that what had been built got us to a plateau that enabled us now to take this next step, that we could never have gotten to this new point had we not gone through where we were before. And it's too easy to think, why didn't we just do that from the start? Well, it doesn't work that way. There's a natural sequence and process that you go through to achieve these sorts of uh, plateaus that give you the credibility in the market, give you an understanding from what the customers are going to accept, and give the employees an understanding of you know, what their role is in all of that. So, great points. Great. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and now, Sharif and Sybil from Zipwire. Well, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to uh, present Zipwire. Um, Zipwire as was stated in the uh, introduction, it's a mobile payment service that enables people to send and receive money with a text message. Um, the way it works is uh, it uh, uses a linked account model. So basically a person will come up to, to the Zipwire site, create an account, and then link a, uh, a funding source of some sort, a bank account, a credit card, or a debit card to your Zipwire account. Funds are transferred from, your, from that, um, say, your bank account to your Zipwire account, and then you have those, those funds now are mobile enabled. So you can send them to somebody else that has a, another account, another Zipwire account. The payments in general, uh, by definition, are, it, it requires two parties. It requires the sender and the receiver to both agree on the payment mechanism itself. For the longest time, we've been conditioned that there's only three forms of payment available to us. We have cash, we have checks, and we have plastic. And we're pretty much also conditioned to know when to use them and how to use them. So, you know, if I'm going to pay back my friend for for dinner or something, I'm going to go reach in for, uh, you know, for cash. If I'm going to pay uh, my rent, for example, I might be with a check. And if obviously I'm going to a restaurant or, or some other event, I'm going to use, use plastic. And so our adoptability problem is one of not just user acquisition, getting people into the system itself, but also changing people's payment behavior. Understanding that they can uh, now, instead of reaching for, for three separate payment instruments, instead of reaching for cash for this and check for that, and and plastic for, for this other thing, I can now just reach for my phone. My phone becomes my universal payment instrument where I can use it for, for all of those purposes. Um, so user acquisition, getting people into the system was one issue, but then the real fundamental problem was uh, actually changing the, the behavior of now both the, 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 the payer and the payee. Um, and that also raised another chicken and egg problem. Well, if you have a bunch of people in the system that want to use mobile payments, want to use their mobile phone to make a, 
to pay for stuff, you have to have the other, the other party uh, also participate in that payment transaction. So what we ended up finding is that we had, uh, the, system, the system itself is capable of doing three separate things. It's capable of person-to-person -person transactions. So again, if we go out to, uh, to, to, to lunch or dinner and I owe you $20, I can just take out my phone and I can zip you the 20 bucks. Um, it's also capable of consumer-to-business models, so uh, consumer-to-business payments, such as uh, going to a coffee shop, going to a restaurant, and being able to pay for your, uh, for your, for your products or services in that way. And the third way that it works is that it, uh, for text donations. So as we all saw in, in, in the recent uh, crisis in Haiti with the American Red Cross, uh, I think they, they uh, ended up getting about $30 million in text donations. Uh, there's a huge market out there for, for nonprofits to be able to, to raise funds using uh, the mobile phone. It's, it's readily accessible and it's, it's, it, you're able to capture the person, the donor at the time of, of the actual event itself when they're, when they're most likely to give. So Zipwire was actually built from the ground up to be able to support those three business, uh, those three channels of accessing uh, uh, your customer users. Uh, so the question that we then had was, where do we start? I mean, do we start after the individuals, trying to get them to use it on a person-to-person -person level? Do we go after the uh, businesses, trying to get them to accept forms of payments, uh, accept Zipwire, this new method of payment uh, 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 for accepting payments that way? The, the issue then becomes the, chicken, the classic chicken and egg issue where the consumers will, yeah, they'll come on board, they'll use it, they'll try it out, but then the first thing they'll ask is, well, where else can I use it? Businesses, on the other hand, uh, you know, we can give them all the incentives and, and, and to, to maybe try it out, test it out, and use it, but then their issue is, well, where are your customers to be able to come in and choose it in our store? So we, we actually um, had to pick, really, you know, which way, which way to go. And we ended up deciding that the way to uh, tackle this adaptability problems were with uh, strategic partners. It wasn't going after individual, con while giving consumers, giving individual users the ability to uh, access the system, use the system, and, and be able to use it for their person-to-person -person transactions, we realized that that wasn't going to be enough for them to actually uh, use it on a recurring basis. What you do use your, your cash, you know, your transactions on a, on a much more regular basis. I, I mean, for example, going out and paying somebody back for dinner or lunch, that happens once, twice a month maybe. Uh, paying your bills every, every month, uh, going to restaurants, coffee shops, those are all situations where you're constantly using your payment transactions. So it was is definitely a, um, a situation where we had to give, we had to focus more on the, on the business side in order to, um, to, to provide that ecosystem where people would have the ability to use their, their mobile phone for payments uh, once, once they were uh, aware that, that that was an option for them to have. So we, um, our strategy was to go after um, the two segments which were built into the system, which were the, um, the uh, uh, business, going after uh, strategic partners with businesses, and then also going after uh, and, and talking to partnering with nonprofits that already had a donor base out there that were looking to donate uh, and use and, and giving them the option of being able to donate with, with, uh, with their mobile phone. And, and that's been actually um, a very successful way of um, achieving what our, our ultimate goal of not only creating a, an environment where people can, can uh, use mobile payments, use and actually become comfortable with the actual process of making a payment with a mobile phone, but then once they've become accustomed to it, for example, with making a donation to the Police Athletic League or any of the other nonprofits that we have that we work with, then they're more likely to use it at the restaurant, and then they're more likely to use it with their with their friends and peers. So it's almost a, it's almost like we're sort of taking them through a, a process, a learning process of okay, well you're comfortable making a text donation, now you're comfortable buying a cup of coffee, now you're going to be more comfortable uh, uh, making a payment with your friends. So it's 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 become uh, it's it's an interesting problem because we're we're actually changing people's behavior of how, of, uh, instead of, re again, instead of reaching from your, for your cash or check or plastic, it's going to say, well, you know, now your phone can, can replace those three uh, vehicles and being able to use your phone for um, one, it, using the phone as a single source for all those payments. So, I mean, that's on a very high level, um, and obviously, introduction of Zipwire and, and what we, the, the issues that we, that we that we face and and, and tackle on a day-to-day -day basis.
Great. Thank you very much. So comments? Yeah. Did you, uh, I mean, I, I see your issue. You know, you've got both the, the users and the uh, recipients, uh, as it were, that you know, you've got to get both communities. Um, did you ever consider doing more of a community-based, um, you know, take University of Pennsylvania, which is quite close to here. Um, you have both, um, you know, students and then you have a pretty small ecosystem, as you were, of all the places within, say, four or five blocks of campus that you could probably get to, um, well, I don't know, it's a, kind of up to you, but you could certainly approach to see if they would use your, your product. And you might have an additional benefit in that, um, you know, rather than the student themselves refreshing the product, perhaps the parents of the students who are footing the bills could refresh the product and know that it's going to, you know, here, there, wherever, in, in some ways, um, might be a, a way to kind of shortcut a transaction that happens uh, Right. Already. So just as a, a thought, I'm not sure if you can. Well, actually, and that actually, or... to, to that point, exactly. Uh, one of our first, uh, in thinking about how are we going to approach this this chicken and egg problem, we wanted to find a natural ecosystem, and, and universities were absolutely were absolutely right on the top of the list. I mean, you have you have the students themselves uh, in you know in a closed environment, and then you have the outlier merchants that are going to be readily that will do whatever the students dictate to them, basically, the other way around. So uh, one of the, our first strategic partners was, we, I mean, we were very fortunate to get a meeting with Steven Starr and the Starr organization, and, and he was very interested in being able to, to accept mobile payments as a, as a way to innovate and, and, to lead the, and to lead the restaurant space here. Uh, and so we uh, worked with him to integrate uh, Zipwire at Pod, which is right outside you know, here, and uh, giving the, the university students now a real place where they can actually use it and see it in action. Um, as far as the, the parents themselves being a, a, a vehicle to, to uh, as the channel to reach the students, we've actually seen that, where we've actually had parents sign up because they didn't want to be bothered by sending their, parent, their kids a uh, cash check or, or you know, money with cash and checks, and actually got their kids to sign up um, by sending them money that way. So it, it, is, it absolutely is the, 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 the right model to approach, um, which is trying to find those closed ecosystems. Just in, in the, the Key part of that, though, was if the parents put money into the thing, you could perhaps limit the vendors that, uh, you know, the type it vendors they could take as opposed to a Visa card, which, you know, they can go down pretty much anywhere and do whatever. So well, actually, what we found is, is getting the merchants is a lot easier than getting the, 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 the users. Um, the, our incentives for merchants are very, it's a very clear-cut uh, value proposition. I mean, mo businesses accept credit cards. They pay two, somewhere between 2 and 5 and 3%. Uh, transaction fees, and when we go in there and we say we can charge you one and a half percent, uh, businesses are very likely to, to accept well, that, it. No, this was a reason for the users to adopt it because if I'm a parent and I give my uh, my student a Visa card, they can go down and to you know one of Stephen Starr's bars downtown and exactly. blow it all. But perhaps you guys could limit to where they could spend it, and then you've got a you know you've got you're offering something that's far superior for a parent than a Visa card or what have you. That's a great point. Sorry. Um, so we've, we've done a lot of work, like to your point, University of Penn, and we've done a lot of work with different colleges and universities and just feeling them out for it. And um, I always thought that everyone had that, that card that I had that I could go to the bookstore, I could get my dining stuff, and not everybody's adopting that card. And so what's really cool is they're bringing us in to create a mobile ecosystem. So we work, we work with, I would say, our strongest pilot right now is um, Monmouth College in Monmouth, Illinois, middle of nowhere um, and it's fantastic because parents can these kids come from everywhere parents can zip money and they and then this, we're now getting restaurants and businesses in that area and things like that so we're creating this mobile ecosystem one of the things that people brought up were you know we're concerned about kids spending because I don't know about you guys but that's where I learned how not to use my credit card was college um, <laughs> and so I'm not still paying for it because my parents cracked down but I that's how that's how I learned not to use it but they talked about working with their students to create a budgeting system, working with students and parents to create this budget, budgeting system through Zipwire. Um, and we thought that was really, really cool because we have this whole different wallet system where I have a wallet for groceries, I have a wallet to pay my dog walker, I have a wallet to pay my babysitter, and it's this whole way I budget through Zipwire. But um, the colleges, yes, you're right, there's some we can talk about, some we can't, um, but it is. That's the ecosystem where there's lots of shops, Cash is normally being exchanged. You know, kids are, it's, it's that perfect demographic of quick adoptability where they don't ask a lot of questions. There's a ton of security in there, so I'm okay with that. But they'll just, they'll just pick it up and start using it, and that's what we've seen. I just want, I, I want to reinforce.
reinforce just what was said and, and go back to something that you started with. I think this is a moment in which you really narrow focus your market, your target market. It's so clear in terms of everything that's just been said and also was, was apparent when I looked at the website that <clears throat> an ideal marketplace is that college part. And I would say forget not-for-profits at this point. Forget being broader. Just focus on that group. You've got a couple of things going for you. All the things you've just mentioned, plus the fact that as you breed this new generation of users of your product, they will leave and be the infectors of the next generation as they go out. And so being narrow and focused will get you much more mileage than being as broad. You're, this almost strikes me, um, you know, uh, crossing the chasm syndrome. You're trying to reach too many people at the same time and ultimately going to fall fat, flat in your face. But if you narrow and focus it, you could really be, uh, take off and distinguish yourself from a lot of the other competition that's out there right now and that's going to be really in your face very soon. Right. Yep, that's a great point, Maya. Um, it's kind of a two-parter, but do you guys envision a world in the future where this is the only way to exchange money or is this the fourth one on top of checks, cash, and credit cards? You probably view it differently than I do. <laughs> I'll give you my opinion. Okay. I, I think that, uh, that it, it's it's, gonna, it's an evolution. Uh, I mean, I think that if you were ba uh, you know back in the 70s when plastic was still first being introduced, I don't think anyone would have seen it be what it is today. I, I think that the mobile phone, I, everyone out here has a mobile phone on their, on their table. Uh, and, and that's, the, everyone has it. It's something that you, that you reach for constantly, you, and it's sort of become more, it, I mean, it started out as a communication device and it's turned into a lifestyle device, and I think it's gonna ultimately evolve into your payment device. Um, you know, it, I think in the beginning it becomes a complementary s system, but I think in, in the end it just becomes it just becomes part of what you how you pay. Whether it's something that you swipe over a cash register or something that you actually text to uh, make a donation, but because I, I guess from an adoptability standpoint, me being a consumer, I don't even use checks anymore. Right? Like I want my life to be simple. So the thought of adding another system and another account to handle is sort of intimidating to me. So how would you target me as a consumer and say, hey, this is actually simpler and a better way to do things? I think I think what's been cool for me is is from a convenience. So I'm I'm totally convenience driven. And so what I get to do is anything that's in my wallet, I can funnel through my zip wire. Um, so I'm just using my phone, and chances are my phone is already in my hand anyway. Um, you know, we always harp on the, st the statistic where people lose their wallet, it takes them about 24, 48 hours to realize that you lose your phone. Uh, whatever I say, people say less than that. So it, you, I realize it in an hour, um, and it, they take better care of it. But I'm, I'm always going to come up against people that, you know, people are like, I don't forget my wallet. I don't have a problem with that. And, and that's great. It's not a service for everyone right now in their life. But from a matter of convenience, when you have one more account to manage, I'm now managing all my accounts through my phone. And it's just, for me, I find it that much easier. So that's how I would pitch you. One question we have in the audience there. Hello. Getting people accustomed to using mobile payments be to flip it around and create mobile savings. So for every time I go to Starbucks and I decide, or I'm tempted to go to Starbucks and I could save $2, maybe I could instantly move those $2 from my checking account to a savings account. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. That's a great model. Mm -hmm. Great, well thank you very much to, to all, all of our participants and our panelists. <laughs> Are there any more questions from the audience for the panelists? We have, or the, the fish bowls, we have two minutes. Any other audience questions? Over here. I'm uh, very excited about Zipwire, and I know everybody said stay in the colleges and universities, but I have a non-profit event on December the 2nd for a million people, and the costs of people um, paying, they all pay one dollar, and if you look at the cost that we actually receive versus the dollar, it's such a ripoff. And so it's very interesting for me that people could text the, the one dollar in. And so I'm not, but I don't quite understand what the consumer would have to create on their telephone. So they can do a text and it goes against their phone bill, or they have to put their credit card into the system first. Like, I, I'm not, I'm wondering how easy it, it is to advertise that on our landing page. Um, so the way, so 
I could spend, like, to your point, I could spend all day with nonprofits, um, and I absolutely love it, pitching. I don't even pitch Zip to Give. I just explain it, and then they adopt it. So um, that's been great. Now, what happens when an, uh, a nonprofit comes to us is, right now, everyone's very over PayPal. They're very over paying the fees. They saw the American Red Cross campaign for Haiti, and they think this is the ticket. Um, Although I do believe every nonprofit should adopt text giving, because I think this is one more thing that needs to be in that solution toolkit. Now 20-somethings, 30-somethings are more accessible by their phone. Um, you have to look at it and be prepared to market it in a different way. Um, so what happens is since Zipwire is an account-based model, it's a little different than Haiti, which is what everyone's very, very familiar with. That one, that's a carrier billing-based model where it goes right on your cell phone and you pay your cell phone uh, bill. Uh, we looked at that model and we weren't happy with um, a lot of different things. No flexibility, lack of security, and you got to really pay to ride those rails of the telecoms, right? So uh, what we have done is um, zip to give benefits from our core security, our core business of P2P and C2B, where it's an account-based model. I'm at your event, you, you tell me a compelling message, I text your code word to 56624, What's happening right now is you get a link back on that t sends you to a, the Zipwire forward slash your organization's page, and people check out and make that donation. Um, this is where, when I sit with nonprofits, they go, "Oh, another step." I don't, you know, if I'm asking people to do another step, I don't think it's going to work. The best question I had in the very beginning was, "What's the difference between me pitching my Zip to Give code and my website?" Well, no one's going to your website anymore when you have a gala, when you have a dinner, when you're up speaking and you're saying, hey, you know, if you, if you think we've done some hard work, I know you paid for your ticket tonight, but keep giving, check out our website. Everyone goes home and they go on with their lives. They don't go to your website, uh, depending on what kind of event it is, they don't have a check on them. I don't, I don't have a check on me. You probably don't take a credit card right there, uh, but I do have my phone. So if you can get me that first piece, if you can get me to get me hooked with that little call to action by texting. I use the word happy in meetings, happy to 56624 to donate $5. And I go home, I get a link, I go to the link when I go home, and I enter my credit card information, and the money goes right to you. Now, what if I go on with my life? Like I just said, I go home, I'm busy, I forget about it. We send what we call a gentle reminder or a tap on the shoulder that says, thank you so much for that pledge. Please, please don't forget to complete your donation. And that's going to come through um, one every three days. After three days, we feel like people are not going to donate. Um, if you're looking at text giving for your organization, you should look at mobile carriers. We, tell, we give people a list of, of all, we explain our service. We give people a list of who else they should look at. Um, you don't get your money for about 120 days. It's high fees. There's no flexibility. And I can grab your phone. Uh, my intern tell, told me the best story where when guys ask for their phone numbers, they would, te they would be like, no problem, grab their mobile phone and text Haiti to 90999. I think that's fantastic, right? It's evil, but it's fantastic. Um, you can do that with mobile carrier billing. And, and that, when I tell people, that, that really kind of freaks them out because I can do that up to 10 times and it puts, uh, it puts your organization in a really bad light because they're going to blame it on you. They're not going to blame it on mobile giving. They're going to blame it on you. Um, and what's also interesting for text donations, obviously I do this all day, um, text donations is that foundations like Mobile Giving, who we've had a really great chance to work with, and they're, they're wonderful people, they're not taking the grassroots organizations, the smaller organizations. If you can't bring in so much money, they're not going to even talk to you. Um, like right, right away, they want to know how much money you bring in a year. So I, I answered your question, I think, Ray. It really, yeah, it's good. I, I think it's a very... <laughs> interesting for nonprofits, and definitely the market for me is uh, moms who Twitter, so that they are on their phone constantly. Right. For me, this is a perfect, we would still have the payment options on our site, but encourage them to pay a different way instead. Yeah, and really the incentive for you, and we do get a lot of users through zip to give um, the incentive for you is that you're not paying those high fees. So just by encouraging people to donate a different way, you're making more money. Yeah, and we could tell them that, that when I found out what the fees were, I think yeah. we get 67 cents and they get the rest. It's, yeah. It made me want to throw up. Yeah, I have organizations yeah. that, you know, 2.5 to 3%, some pay 5, it's, some pay 6%. Really it's, it gets a little crazy out there. So yeah. I think um, it's a great it's, idea. that's why we get a lot of organizations that, that come to us. Good. Thank you. Sure. With that being said, give everyone on stage a round of applause. Thank you guys.
to our Fishbowl Companies Equal App Healthy Human Zip Wire to our fabulous panelists. With that being said, it is time for, oh look, I'm, we're behind on the slides. It's time for the most popular part of the day. Now, it's time for lunch, so please go out, meet someone new, thank a sponsor or a volunteer, connect with a presenter, thank them for coming out and spending their time to share with you today. We are going to endeavor to be seated again in the one o'clock time frame. So, go. We hope you enjoyed this program from the Founder Factory. For more information, visit phillystartupleaders.org. We produce this program in the studios of Professional Podcasts in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. For everyone at the Philly Startup Leaders and Founder Factory, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us and take good care. <laughs>